Hi there, and welcome to Bike File with me, Wazza. This week on the show, Louise is going to be doing this, while Rod will be doing this. And in the meantime, for your delectation and enjoyment, I should be here with Suzuki's GSX-R600, as you see before you now. Own the racetrack was what Suzuki proclaimed when they launched this bike just over two years ago. And to be honest, since its launch, it hasn't disappointed. In its first year of competition with Carl Harris in the British Supersport Series, it won the title. As well as that, in the two years since it came on the market, it has managed to pretty much clean the honours in the 600 Supersport group test. So, a good bike with a fine pedigree, and as with all GSXRs, this is a proper screaming lunatic, even though it is still just a 600. So, come with me if you will, and just check out the noise that this thing makes. enough to make the hairs stand up on the back of your neck. And I suppose now would be as good a time as any to talk about this motor. She's a 599cc inline four cylinder double overhead cam motor that powers the GSX-R600. Nothing too spectacular, it's pretty much exactly the same layout as used by all of the 600s. But to put it that way, doesn't quite do this engine justice. It's the way that it makes its 102 horsepower that sets it apart from the competition. You see, the GSX-R has better drive than the rest of them everywhere. The best bottom end, the best mid-range, and a top end as well. The only thing that aces it on the top end slightly is the R6, but then that is a harder bike to ride because it doesn't quite have the mid-range drive. Whether you want to potter about or go mad, the GSX-R can actually do both for you. Now it's over to Louise. You know, a bike should be for life, and not just for Christmas, but sadly, that isn't always the case. As riders become more experienced, they tend to go for lighter, powerful, and a for sale sign can easily pop up. But if you're the type of person who likes to grow with and not grow out of your motorcycle, then don't overlook this slinky little number. It's the Suzuki SV650S and it could be right up your street. The bike is built around a 90 degree 645cc V-twin featuring double overhead cams and four valves per cylinder. Its design is derived from its larger siblings, the TL1000S and the TL1000R. Despite the bike's competitive pricing, make no mistake, this motor is absolutely the very latest in technology, producing 70-odd horses at 9,000 RPM. The SV six-speed transmission is smooth and the gear ratios are well spaced, with its broad torque curve providing good pull from 3,000 RPM all the way through to the red line, you have more than enough gears to work with, and sixth gear is comfortably high at motorway speeds. The chassis and the swing arm are developed in part for their good looks, but they're made up from cast aluminium, which is extremely strong and stiff. You won't be able to tax this bike on the streets, and I've heard that apparently this chassis is super core cool for track days, so all you speed enthusiasts out there, you'll have no problem with that. Okay, so the motor and the chassis are very good, but what about the handling? Well, if anything, the handling is even more impressive. Start with the stiff, well-designed chassis we've already discussed and add to it the extremely low weight, around 169 kilos dry, a 
according to Suzuki, some quality rubber and you have a stable yet nimble package. Now although the suspension is quite soft for hard charging through the corners, the chassis almost makes up for it. Besides, the softest suspension turns out to be perfect for most everyday riding purposes. Now the brakes, in keeping with this theme, are excellent for a bike around this price range. Minimum force and just a couple of fingers is all you need to bring this lovely little SV nicely to a halt. So the SV is light, it's nimble, it's easy to ride, it's predictable and it's fast. Not only that, but it's well priced, so what have we got so far? Well, it's looking good, but let's check out those scores on the doors. Well, I reckon it's a truly impressive bike that'll satisfy both the novice and the more experienced rider. Power is there, it's plentiful, and it's delivered in a characterful way. The brakes have plenty of stopping power, and this chassis is an absolute joy. So I reckon, to sum it up for performance, we'll give it a generous 9 out of 10. Comfort. Well, it is biased more towards a sportier riding position, and that can be a little heavy on the wrist for someone who's smaller and a bit lighter like myself. Although the overall comfort factor is there, and I reckon this little SV deserves 8 out of 10. And that brings us on to quality of the bike. It's build quality. Let's give it 9 out of 10. You know, those Japanese really know how to put a bike together. And for the price of this bike, they've used high quality components and there's a lot of workmanship gone into it. You know, it's not that easy really to find a bike that's as happy cruising up and down the motorway as it is tearing around a racetrack. And all for the bargain price of around £4,800. And for that, this SV deserves another 9 out of 10. Now let's talk street cred for a minute, shall we? This isn't a bad looking bike. I mean, it will blend in with most other bikes at the traffic lights. It doesn't exactly jump out at you. But if you want to go the whole hog, fit a natty little exhaust on the bike and it'll sound just like a Ducati Superbike. And for that, for now, it earns a street cred figure of 7 out of 10. The GSX R600 is also fuel injected, and when it was launched, this was considered the cream of 600cc throttle response. The 16 bit ECU, the brain, if you like, of the motor that measures the fuel air mix across the rev range, did a fantastic job and basically gave very nice response everywhere. However, time, tide, and technology stand still for no man, least of all in the very competitive 600s class. And for next year, on the ZX6 and the new CBR, we're going to see 32-bit ECUs in place. Now these are cleverer and what this means is I can tell you having ridden the new ZX6 its throttle response is now better, leaves this feeling ever so slightly snatchy. However compared to the rest of the 600 still on sale for this year this has still got the best throttle response. And so we come to the handling. You'll be pleased to know that the GSX-R600 is a GSX-R in the finest tradition. This means a number of things. First up, it means you get superb, sharp steering from entry to apex to exit. You've got so much control over what you can do with this bike. And this is all backed up by some very high quality standard suspension. Now they've got plenty of adjustment in them should you wish to fiddle, but I don't suppose you really need to unless you're going very, very mad at the track. Another standard GSX-R trait these days is the non-adjustable steering damper bolted underneath the headstock there. To be honest, it's not really that much of a bother. At high speed, it does keep the bike nice and composed when it may be flapping about a bit down bumpy back roads. But below 50 mile an hour, you will notice it, the steering feels a little woolly. Not a total problem, and really, I'd say you can get away with leaving it on there. Another GSX-R trait which is less endearing are these brakes. There's plenty of power there, they do stop you, they do do the business at the track, but they are not the best. They're a little bit wooden, the feel is not particularly brilliant, and they are really the biggest Achilles heel on an otherwise superb motorcycle.
GSX R600 is a supreme track performer, but as you and I know, we do not spend all of our time on track days. So it's a good job that the engine's manners mean that this bike is also very good on the road. As well as that, there are a smattering of practicalities aboard the GSX R600. Take for instance, this tail unit. We have a nice little storage seat under here. And as well as this rather fetching seat hump, you also get a rather comfortable pillion seat. Nice little pegs down here. It's not the best perch in the world, but if you need to stick the girlfriend somewhere, then it'll do. Up front for the riders, nice squashy comfortable seat. It is quite a short distance between the seat and the pegs, which will squash your knees a little bit, but that's a small price to pay. Otherwise, the riding position is quite roomy. Move along further. Nice little clocks here. It tells you the time. There's two trip meters on there. There's a fuel light. Everything you could possibly need and these great big Mickey Mouse ear style mirrors. Granted, they don't look that special, but they're very good for seeing police cars at 140 mile an hour behind you. Not that you'd ever be doing that in this country, obviously. Finally, come with me to the front. Good looking fairing, chunky ram air ducts. Looks cool, helps the bike sound as awesome as it does, but as well as that, doesn't do a bad job of keeping the wind off you. For something as sporty, it's really bearably practical. All in all, it's the GSXR's combination of potent track performance and excellent road manners coupled with its practicalities that have made it the number one Sport 600 for the last two years. It is a very, very fine motorcycle that can be as mad or as civilized as you want it to be. But this is 2002. For 2003, the game is moving on. We already know that the ZX6, which I rode on the launch recently, is going to be a fine tool, which will probably have the measure of this. I should think the CBR600 is unlikely to be hanging around either, so maybe this could be knocked off its top slot for 2003. But this means a couple of things. One, it's still just as good as it is this year, which is fine. And two, it may be a little cheaper than the competition. So don't write it off just yet. And now over to Rod. Regular bike file viewers may be familiar with my fondness for big trailies. Most of the main manufacturers now offer large capacity trail bikes as part of the catalogue and there are some very competent and practical options in the showrooms. But when it comes to taking the crown for king of the monster trailies, this is where the talking stops. BMW's R1150 GS Adventure comes stomping out of its corner with its gloves off, ready to take on all pretenders and reassert itself as top of the heap. BMW more or less invented the big trail bike with the original R80 GS launched an astonishing 22 years ago. A string of Paris-Dakar wins led to the model growing through 1000cc options and re-emerging in the early 90s as a thoroughly modern fuel-injected boxer twin. This latest 1130cc version uses the latest developments of BMW's radical telelever and paralever suspension systems, now with increased travel and adjustable preload and rebound damping. It also carries the latest EVO braking system and braided steel hoses as standard, resulting in a claimed 50% easier braking input from the rider and significantly more stopping power. Make no mistake, this bike not only looks the business, it's designed and engineered to stomp across continents with barely a whisper of complaint from either bike or rider. These spoked wheels are cleverly designed to run tubeless tyres and industry first. And the ABS braking system is switchable offable for serious off-road use. Gearing has been changed with a lower first and a shorter top gear. And the engine management system is now adjustable to cope with the poor quality fuels you'll find if crossing the Sahara or the Indian subcontinent. You can even order the bike with a 30 litre fuel tank and off-road tyres. This bike makes very brisk progress on tarmac and when the road runs out, you just keep going. Ergonomics are brilliant with an excellent riding position and well-placed footrests and handlebars and the seat is adjustable for height. You are seated well into the bike instead of perched high up on it like some of the opposition and the result feels secure and competent. BMW's attention to detail extends to heated handlebar grips with a choice of two settings a fully adjustable screen and optional 75 litre hard luggage. There's even a power socket to hook up your GPS navigation system. 
This whopping boxer engine produces 85 brake horsepower and 72 foot-pounds of torque. Although in a package it looks huge and imposing, but once you're on board the bike, it's surprisingly easy to ride. If you're choosing a bike to circumnavigate the world, this has to be the top of your shortlist. Sports bike riders might leave you behind on the cat and fiddle, but the GS opens up the world. Stick a pin in a map, pick a country and point the GS at it. You'll get there and have adventure on the way. Turning to performance, oodles of power, state-of-the-art brakes and suspension and responsive steering. This bike has it all. In terms of usable performance under any possible conditions, the big GS has few peers. It won't outrun a 600cc sports bike, but set your sights a little further afield and it all begins to make sense. For performance, I'm going to give this 8 out of 10. For build quality now, well, BMW have a reputation for top quality engineering and the GS is well thought out and well put together. Paint finish is good, but all that exposed alloy may need regular hosing off to keep winter salt corrosion at bay. Watch out for the strange seat colour options too. The yellow top seat can look grubby fairly quickly if you ride the bike through the winter. BMW give a two year unlimited mileage warranty on each new bike. I'm going to give this bike 9 out of 10 for build quality. For comfort, 8 again. I just love this riding position. It's big and roomy and being a BMW everything is adjustable. The screen and optional heated grips are brilliant where there's a chill in the air. I have to say the physical size of the bike may make it more suitable for the larger rider. But don't let it put you off trying one out. For value for money, well retailing at £8,495 on the road, the GS isn't cheap, but it does give you an awful lot of bike for your buck. The addition of ABS pushes it up through the nine grand barrier, which makes it much more expensive than the Triumph Tiger or Suzuki V-Strom, both worthy and capable opponents in the market. The GS is such a well-focused and well-engineered motorcycle though, it still looks like good value and a glance through the small ads shows how these bikes hold their price. I'm going to give it 8 for value for money. Street cred. Well, some BMWs do look a little stodgy, but the R1150 GS has a street presence like nothing else. This huge profile coupled with this monster duckbill front fender makes lesser bikes look weedy and soft, and the addition of the BMW logo underlines all that with a commitment to engineering excellence. And if you just want to pause on it down at the local boozer, well, who could blame you? I'm going to give this bike 9 out of 10 for street cred. Street cred. She's a GSXR and her reputation precedes her. She's bold, beautiful, and badass. Nine out of 10. Value for money, eight out of 10. Lot of bike for your cash, and that all important 600cc insurance bracket. As well as this, she's gonna be a bit cheaper than the new 600s, which are gonna be oh so much more fashionable, darling, next year. Performance, nine out of 10. She may be knocked off her top slot in the 600s class next year, but for the time being, this is still the governor. Loads of motor, loads of handling, only losing a point for those wooden brakes. Build quality, eight out of 10. Very solid, needs a little bit of cleaning and looking after every now and again, but there are no major niggles that you will find with a bike like this if you put a few thousand miles on them. Comfort. 7 out of 10. She's a sports bike, so you are going to get slightly sore wrists in town, you are going to get slightly cramped knees on long journeys, but for what she is, very comfortable. 